Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order. You would all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, first up we have some special recognition. Uh, as everyone noticed, we had the Vista Elementary fifth grade orchestra with us this evening. Thank you very much. Dr. Pierce. Okay, um, first I should also just make the announcement that unfortunately we had a sound system issue in our um, boardroom tonight. So when we speak into the microphones, it is going out to anyone who is here uh, attending remotely, but the sound isn't coming out of the speakers here in the room. So we're just gonna um, ask everybody to, to speak real loudly this evening and project voices so hopefully everyone can hear. So I'm so excited tonight because uh, we've invited Vista's fifth grade orchestra to come this evening. Um, their orchestra teacher is Kelly McFadden. Let's give her a big round of applause. Um, and um, we've got uh, Principal Jennifer Behrens here as well as Assistant Principal. <laughs> team um, from Vista here. Thank you for being here tonight. And of course our students who are here because they participated in the middle school orchestra festival in April and scored a superior rank. And I, I'll let Miss McFadden after they play uh, talk a little bit about that, but we'd love to have you um, play one more song and um, anyone who's uh, attending remotely will get to hear it as well.
Hi, my name is Kelly McFadden, and it is my pleasure to work with these wonderful students. These are our fifth graders plus one honorary freshman. Um, <laughs> and these kiddos began playing for the first time on September 20th. That was their first day of playing these instruments, uh, almost all of them ever. And they didn't even really even know how to open their cases at that time. So it really shows to a true testament of their character that they come early every morning, four days a week, 7.45 to 8.30. Um, and they come well practiced, they work really, really hard. And this is the progress they have made just in these eight months. So I'm so proud of them. And, um, <laughs> Thank you, and we're so glad you're here tonight, not only um, so we can recognize you, but so you can also help us make um, tonight's recognition a little more special. So thank you students um, and Ms. McFadden for being here. Um, in addition to recognizing the orchestra, we've got a couple other special recognitions this evening. Uh, we're celebrating our district volunteers. So uh, every spring, our buildings uh, hold some sort of volunteer recognition uh, tea or um, some sort of uh, ceremony to recognize uh, volunteers who come in and read or do other volunteer work in the schools. And we wanted to do that same thing for our volunteers who volunteer on our district committees. So um, we have numerous district committees and parent advisory councils. Um, we've got community engagement board, uh, career and technical education advisories. We have our district equity team, our ECAP preschool advisory, our facilities executive committee, um, our focus committee, uh, instructional materials committee, which is new this year. We've got a migrant and bilingual parent advisory council, a special education parent advisory committee, and new this year as well, a tribal education and collaboration committee. So we have uh, numerous uh, community members and parents and even staff members who volunteer their time on committees and we wanna recognize them this evening. So if you are here um, for, from any of our uh, district committees, you received an invitation to come tonight and be recognized, could you please stand? And I'm going to ask you to remain standing because we have a little something for you and London is helping me with that. So we've got some a special Kennewick School District proud volunteer pins. <laughs> and it's just a small token of our appreciation for all of your time and commitment uh, and energy in investing uh, with our school district to make it the best possible place for students. So we want to thank you, give you a big round of applause, and appreciate you for what you do. And I know I see members of uh, all all of the committees. I think here here tonight. So we appreciate you coming out and taking the time. Uh, hope you got some cookies and punch and enjoyed the wonderful orchestra and uh, hope that you'll continue to work with us next year as well. So thank you so much. And our last special recognition uh, tonight, I put her to work, so <laughs> our, is our, our student school board representative. So I'll wait till, uh, till London 
is finished. Thank you, London, helping pass out those volunteer pins. Uh, because we have a little recognition for London tonight as well. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so London is our 2022-23 uh, student school board representative, and uh, we are coming to the end of the year and London's a senior and she hasn't agreed to stay and continue to serve. Uh, she is going to graduate and, and move on. And London, we've so appreciated, and I know board members are going to want to say a few things, but so appreciated all of your hard work, um, professionalism. You've taken your role so seriously. Uh, you've, you've really gone above and beyond. And so we have a little um, plaque of appreciation for you that says an appreciation of your dedication and service on behalf of the students and staff of the Kennewick School District, London Moody Honored Member, Kennewick School Board 2022-2023. So. And I want to invite board members to uh, share any thoughts they would like to with London. Well, London, like I say, you always shown up. You've always got a big smile on your face. You're always prepared. You have great things to add. You have been nothing but professional and kind, and we truly appreciate it having you on the board. So we're going to miss you, but we know you're going to go do wonderful things. You're welcome. You know, we, we always uh, fight here on the board about different things, and one of the things tonight is the first ones to say congratulations to you. I'm sure we all want to go first. <laughs> I didn't quite make it a first. Sorry. It's okay. But I think you know. You're awesome. Thanks for everything you do. I'm glad you were voted for school. Thank you. Thank you, London. I didn't know that London was my neighbor until this year, and I wish I'd known a long time ago because I'm very proud of her. And she's also a good neighbor. I know that from other neighbors. But I appreciate the fact that you've spent a lot of time with the students, and that's been a very important part this year for a lot of the information that you brought to us. So. I know that you will take your leadership skills and go on and do great things for us. So thanks. Um, London, you're a, you're sweet. You're beautiful. You are a wonderful um, ambassador. You were a hard worker. You're so smart. I'm so proud of you. Love you. Love your family. And um, so I'm really fortunate to know you better. Um, I knew you a little before this, and I know you a lot after. And and, and uh, you and your family just wonderful, wonderful souls. <clears throat> Well, going last is a hard thing to follow up on here, but um, London, you're, you're going to do fantastic things at, at college and um, you've been a fantastic advocate for students this year um, and you've just been a amazing student board rep and I look forward to seeing the big things that you do and thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Great. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very wonderful. much. Wonderful. Well, um, we, we can move on to our uh, business portion of the meeting, but know that this um, we'll probably want to give the students give a, a minute to here to, pack up. Yeah. And, okay, thank yeah, you all again. For stay and watch Stand tall, Mike, on your tiptoes. Yeah, 
I got to get right in front of Mike. That's funny. Maybe they'll see you here. It's shining. <laughs> She told him they could have one cookie. So, um, the girl, I, don't, I don't know her, but the girl at Southridge just won state golf oh, today. Dude. Yeah. Oh, she would do really well. Yeah, just, just, they just posted about it. Good job. I think she was, yesterday she was third, I think. Yeah, she was doing really just, well. I mean, it was really cool. Yeah, you don't remember her last night. Um, Yes, who, that's right. who, I know. Who, I was like, it was Huey. H-U-I. Yeah, Huey. She did. She did really She did Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah,
uh, last week and um, it was just a great event. I know board members um, were invited and so um, I just wanted to highlight the great work that is continuing around family and community engagement. And uh, then I wanted to shift into talking about, which is hard to do, but I, like I said, we have to have a new <laughs> board rep because London won't stay. <laughs> and so <laughs> if, uh, if board remembers, uh, the policy was updated um, this year. So this year, the board's going to be selecting two representatives, a representative elect who will essentially have the opportunity to observe and learn from the student board member who will sit on the dais, uh, and then we'll move into the student board rep position when the board rep graduates, right? So this year we're going to be selecting two, and um, we have uh, interviews. I've been contacting the students who applied, and we have nine students, so we really tried to increase our awareness. London did a really great little informational video, and um, that was shared out just to increase awareness about this leadership opportunity for students and so it did yield a good result like I said we have nine applicants um, and so uh, I know that multiple board members are planning to participate in that interview process we've got that um, on the books but I did make um, we did, Patty made these for me, copies of all of the applicants so everybody can have a chance to look at them even if you're not participating in the interview process. At the interview process, the board members who are participating in that will make the selection, which is essentially a recommendation that then comes to the board for official action. So you can take one of these and pass it on and have a packet and then uh, you've got the time blocked out on your calendars and like I said I've been getting confirmation from the students I think I just need to hear from two more students um, about their time slot and so we'll have a, a full schedule but it's great to have so many so many applicants for the position so I just wanted to share that wonderful thank you London your very last report <laughs> um well, thank you guys for all the sweet words. It means so much. This year has been great. I've absolutely loved this. It's been such an honor and just an amazing experience. And as the year comes to an end, we have one more student advisory meeting. It will be next week and we will be inviting new members. They will be attending. So we will have new members attending that will be sitting with us next year and then Pretty much just graduation. <laughs> for me. So that's all I have, and thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, just real quick, um, I had a uh, call with um, with a fantastic student from Southridge, um, kind of um, sharing with me all the work that he's done on financial literacy and how he's um, been able to grow a club within Southridge to I think over 150 members and this thing is, is taken off but um, a very very bright young man um, and I think he's going to get a chance to come and share some words with us um, here in the one or two board meetings from now um, but uh, it, it was great just to hear his passion for for what he's doing and um, so did that um, and then I would just say good luck to all our athletes at state I know London's you and your team start tomorrow. We've got a bunch of uh, other uh, teams participating. So good luck to everyone. Thank you, Michael. I'm also gonna, gonna um, wish everybody who's um, advancing the state good luck. Um, this is a, this has been the, this week, as everybody knows there was filing week for people who want to run for school board and, and we have some people running this this time, so um, I was actually got got a lot of a lot of phone calls from community members and uh, from candidates and stuff. So um, I spent a lot of time like talking about that kind of stuff and talking to people and potential candidates and stuff. It was actually kind of fun. So um, it really, I felt really engaged in that way. Um, talked to just I felt almost probably more phone calls than I've had in a really long time, but just about that kind of stuff. So um, kind of fun and kind of seeing kind of where where everything's gonna shake out and really excited and. Wish everybody, wish everybody luck. Thank you, Diane. I'm so used to grabbing them. 
Um, I was honored, I guess is the word, to go to the Yakima Nation convening of school directors and uh, tribal leaders last Thursday. Um, and I'll try not to cry. I was telling Ron, um, we spent the morning with nine of the tribal leaders um, telling about their um, experience in school. And it wasn't, except for one, it was not a good experience. And um, one of the examples was one of the men was a very good athlete and tried out for a team and was told, you bet, you're in, you're great, but you have to cut your hair. <clears throat> and he wears his hair long in a braid. And he did even as a young man. And he said, I can't do that. That's, you know, that's part of my heritage. That's where our wisdom comes from. And he was told he couldn't be on the team. And we've come a long way in 40 some years, but we still have a lot of things um, for all of our students but especially some of our smaller groups of students. Um, but then there were some some great things too. And, and one of the things that Dr. Pierce and I talked about when I was telling her about it is we're, we're maybe not counting our students as accurately as we can, our native Alaska Native and American Indian students. And so um, I sent you those papers and hopefully we'll be able to do that because that is actually a treaty right for them to um, have that money come to them, federal and state money and then um, the district is supposed to be doing things with it uh, for them. And so um, that was an amazing uh, time. And one of the great things was we had cheesecake and it had hand-picked huckleberries on it. If you've ever picked huckleberries, <laughs> that's a lot of work. And that was pretty amazing too. Um, <clears throat> I was at the MCP talent show last, that same evening. And the only word I can think about is wow. We, we have some all over. I mean, we saw these kids today, it's super talented, but I was just amazed um, and MCP has some ability to do some different things than other schools work. But if you get a chance next year, um, go to theirs. That was um, very good. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, yesterday was the Key Connections, which we partner with Ben Franklin Health on that. And one of our speakers was Joe Razzo, who's a teacher at Southridge. And he and Chris Blackman, also a teacher at Southridge, and Lorena, who's our um, CIS, um, person up there did a um, after prom drug and alcohol free party at Atomic Bowl. And they had about 400 some kids go to prom and 100 of those kids came to that party. And it was free for the kids to come. And it was from 10 to I think one in the morning. And um, they're gonna do another one next year, hopefully for homecoming and prom. And so um, they were very happy to participate with us on that. Um, and that was it, because I was out of town. There's the time. Thank you, Ron. I have a couple of three <coughs> things. Uh, first is, uh, at the beginning, of, before the kids started playing, I was talking to a couple of three parents, and we were having a discussion, and, and usually, as usual, I brought some homework for you. Tracy. Uh, the arts this week has also included sports has been uh, the time for plays and some musicals, I think, going on this week. And to help with attendance, is it possible that we can get the school, the whole school involved? I mean, here's, here's what I mean is that you have the plays been put on, but we have DACA that can handle the financial side and could aid in, in putting on the play and put with promotions. We have the art department, different parts that could help uh, make a poster that can be shared in the community so that you can get the word out better. Journalism, they could get on the radio, promote it, and make it part of the curriculum. That this time of the year, they come up with some class project to promote the plays or whatever is going on. And, and Dave, you mentioned the, the person with the economic side, they can add with how can we raise money? How can we? fund this, that can be part of the econ class, economic class or money management class. And, and by doing so, the whole class is part of that production and more apt to come and watch the production since they uh, had some input in the production. Just an idea. Okay, the other part is that uh, we got a little reading competition going. I brought it up last time, I'm bringing it up again tonight. <laughs> Sadly to say, I don't know. I shouldn't say so. I think Diane passed me. 51. Right? She 51. showed it and she was gladly showing it tonight. And and there's also a celebration around that. 
uh, Washington Elementary is going to have a celebration on May 25th from 11:30 to noon, and again on June 5th from 12 noon to 12:30. Uh, if you can make one of those, I, I've asked permission. Shauna, she hadn't got back to me yet, but uh, if we could go to those, I think that would be great. One of the one or two of those celebrations, because the kids take pride in and also uh, that reading competition. And I, I think I beat those kids. You might be very surprised. I know yeah. I'll be surprised. Those that's kids are readers. Anyway, that's what I. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I've had doing some school visits this week, and one of the coolest visits I had was at Hawthorne. I walk in the door and there was, I got there right on time, walked in the door and here was this very nice young lady named Kennedy. She stuck out her hand and said, Mr. Connors, pleasure to meet you. If you'd follow me, please, I'd like to show, walk you down and meet my two friends. And I can't remember all their names, but she introduced me to two nice young men and they shook my hand and they marched me over and said, oh, we'd like you to show your other friends, please follow us, sir. And they walked me down the hall and they gave me a 30 minute tour of the school That's before great. I even saw the principal. And it was awesome. They stood up straight, they shook my hand, they answered my questions, yes sir, no sir, what can we do for you? Walked me back to the principal and handed me off and it was absolutely the coolest thing. And it, it was just really cool that uh, Principal Miller and his staff are teaching these soft skills, which I think are so important for these kids to understand some of the things and that just goes so far for them later in life. So anyway, I was just really proud and I wanted to make sure that I shouted it out. Again, the other schools have wonderful things going on as well, but that really stood out to me as something that I wanted to make sure I mentioned here today because it was really pretty spectacular. Piggybacking on that, did you all get the email from Hawthorne about the, um, I told you the date, now I don't remember, but um, from Jessica Vidalik about attending their um, volunteer thing since we were amazing shape people yes. did you get it yes look I, there it is okay. <laughs> what's the date? I, I obviously didn't make the cut uh, no, I'm me either mike <laughs> yeah exactly well, uh, someone had to go so it may as well be me <laughs> uh, may 31st from 3 to 3 30. you're invited i know you're are. are you sure okay I'm awesome sure you thank you i don't want to be that guy <laughs> no, no. Awesome. Party crasher. Yeah, exactly but i think that's exactly you know that's what you saw that amazing shake that's it was it was was really really cool i was super super impressed Okay, uh, moving on, reports and discussions. We have the preliminary budget for 23-24. And as always, Mr. Roberts with his magical spreadsheets. All right. Oh, uh, you do, I, I gave you a comparison three districts. That's what the OSPI has a tool. Okay, thank and, you for that. I was gonna ask what this was for, so thank yeah, you. They, they usually don't get it all completed <laughs> until like uh, in April, so. It's from last year, but it's interesting uh, information. So uh, not a lot of change from the last meeting. I'll just touch on a few items here uh, down the bottom here. The uh, property tax increased that a little bit uh, based on looking at collections in the spring versus fall uh, so we expect to get a little more in the spring here of january 2000 uh, 2024 uh, collections there so just a small increase and then the the levy equalization formula that was updated by the state and that would result in a little more money than what we had projected and mostly the state just came out and said their other uh, computation model is up to date so we'll be plugging in some numbers and hopefully being pretty close to matching all these numbers up here. But uh, so slight change there, uh, 21.5 million on the basic ed local funded increase. And then some changes here on the the, the staff, non-staff cost. Uh, there's a few staff here we missed that were on leave that, uh, you know, substitutes were in those positions. So that kind of got increased a little bit here. And then uh, some programs down here um, lap there's uh, some teachers there that were teaching some classes and for next year those classes won't be offered and, and so those have, those have to go back into basic ed so that creates a cost there 
and some CTE also got shifted to basic ed. So instead of, you know, CTE paying say $100,000, now it's gonna go to basic ed and that increases those numbers. So that, that's part of the staffing process. So the change there about 12.4 million there. So we, we did gain a little bit of ground with that revenue change, but, uh, and here's the numbers, there's 21.5, that's the revenue change. And then 12.48, that's this number down here. So we're still right around, and we've, we've whittled this down a little bit. And remember, we, we're losing about $13 million of uh, levy levy equalization. So if we had that, we'd be pretty, a lot better shape. Uh, but, um, and then the, the prior year we lost about 20 million there. So, so those numbers have changed a little bit. We're really more concerned about 24, 25. So this number here, it needs to be probably $5 million or less and we can manage that. And there's a lot of projections here, 24, 25, you know, 100 more kids, we're, we're saying here that's 950,000. Um, there will be some more SEL funding, uh, but uh, that is really, you know, we don't have any mental health in the budget uh, for next year. The mental health in the budget this, or the, the mental health in the budget for next year is funded through ESSER. And in 24, 25, it's not in here at all. The same thing with the tutoring. So, so there's quite a bit uh, left there. There's curriculum costs that uh, are not in the budget. We, we have about 200, 300,000 in there. If the state numbers come in a little better than what I'm projecting, we'll put a little more in that. But again, that's gonna have to be looked at. So uh, the concern is here, you know, 24, 25 and these out years. And, you know, there's some unknowns, enrollment, some of these things we just don't know. Um, but uh, we, we gotta keep that uh, in this neighborhood continue to get through the next uh, two or three years. Um, any any questions so far on that? Yeah, Vic, can you just clarify when you say there there's no mental health in the budget? What do you what what does that mean? Like, yeah, let me go. We... Uh, let me go to one more page here. OK, so so here's the, the overall. Uh, if you look at 23, 24, when you look at all the revenue, uh, 20, 293 million versus uh, 309 million expenses. And here's that difference we've been talking about, the 16 million uh, right here. So there's no, the, the mental health contract with comprehensive is over a million dollars. That's not in here. So when I put the ESSER money in, it's gonna be about 15 to 20 million of revenue and five to 10 million here, it'll be in that number. Okay. Yeah, so in 23, 22, 23, this was the budget we worked with. And then we added $15 million of ESSER and $5 million of ESSER cost. So the net there is 10 million. That's where you get that 10 million. Right. And uh, the 10 million difference is really gonna come out and it's gonna pay for these bunch of salaries. Um, but anyway, the, the ESSER then would have been down here in the 5 million, the tutoring and that. So does that clarify that a little bit? And, and this is, uh, you know, the overall, what we're looking at preliminary, it, it could change a little bit uh, for the 21st as, as some numbers change, but hopefully not significantly. And uh, like I said, we, we have $35 million of ESSER left at the end of last year. Uh, we're gonna use probably about 15 this year, and then we'll use 15 to 20 next year. And that'll be put in here with five to 10 million here. So we're talking about a, a curriculum adoption uh, for next year of math, which is, uh, could be pretty expensive, you know, a couple million dollars or more, I'm not sure. And that would be part of that, along with mental health and tutor. And then here's another uh, another way of looking at the, the budget. This one, the top part of the basic ed local funded. So any programs where we have to use uh, tax dollars or local funds. And this is really what we've been, we've been talking about with with kind of the changes in revenue and, and, and that. Down here at the bottom are programs, we really can't use that money. Um, and that's where I say like uh, CTE, if some costs had to come out of here, they go to basic ed, you know, that, that makes things a little worse for us. Uh, the numbers here, this is overhead. This is allowed costs that we can take uh, for, uh, you know, your overhead admin, those type of things. But uh, mostly we've been working with this, you know, what's the change in revenue expenditures and, uh, and now we're kind of bringing it all together here. So any questions on some of these? We're still working with food service. It's kind of a placeholder. I'm gonna be meeting with them next week and they do their meal counts and and uh, that revenue, but they're, they will uh, get enough revenue to cover this two or $300,000.
Any, any questions? Yeah. Um, the CTE <coughs> that shifted back to BE, why was that? What classes or? There's some classes uh, that were in, I think, Chinook. Uh, they had uh, the, with the art requirement, the science and some things, and they needed space. And one of the CTE te teachers went over to do science and some of that. Okay. That was part of it. And then some other some other admin costs that uh, since CTE's enrollment is down, there's just a few things to move around to, so they can continue to, to meet some of their needs. And then my second question, that state retirement decrease, that 5% or yes. whatever, almost six, where does that go then, that money? That's not being It's spent. just net savings. So in the big picture, it just, uh, you know, in, in say this uh, scenario here, it's net savings that, that's, you know, received. If, if we didn't get that, this would be changed, this number here by $800,000. It'd be 16 point eight five million whatever that difference was it's right here 826 it would change the bottom line okay. but yeah. yeah so you might have heard um the state saying how you know that creates savings for districts that uh, retirement change and that that's exactly what they're talking about we we're getting uh your 4.5.6 million there and uh, 5342 there so a little bit of difference and it helps us a little bit. So any other questions on this uh, sheet here, some of these other programs, um, you know, bilingual federal programs, uh, all those programs have to fund themselves and provide a little bit of overhead uh, admin type costs. Then uh, Kind of a summary of what we've discussed a lot of this i think we've already went over the levy um, you know that's another 13 million uh, that, that we're not going to see next year the ESSER funds talked about that uh, like i said math curriculum here it's it's a big cost and um, um, there'll be more on that probably throughout the the year next year you know some of those those type of costs you know it's always hard to you know how, how do you gauge success you know how, how does you uh gauge the need you know if, if you do a roof you know you see it you know and some of those things and you buy a, a bus you, you see it and i think uh, dr pierce in her weekly update talking about assessment you know there's a bunch of bullets there you know about you know how, how do you determine you're getting your money's worth or you can measure it and that's some of the things we have difficulty with especially with you know, spending two, three million dollars on things, uh, curriculum and those type of things. You really need to, you know, how, how do you measure that? Communities and schools, uh, 11 schools. There was a placeholder in the contract to add three schools over the next three years. Um, you know, we'll just have to look at the funding again next year and see what we can do. And we talked about the mental health contract there. We've talked about counselor funding, school safety. Oops. Another one here. Here's a little bit on the CTE. Uh, ECAP. So we are moving to portable there, and they probably won't be getting uh, more students next year, but the following year they should be uh, having uh, be able to converting the half day slots to some full day slots. So they'll should be prepared for that with the portable remove. So the teen parent program we started, uh, I think it started up uh, November, December last year, and there's 15 kids in attendance every day. So that's uh, probably helping 15 of our students uh, continue to get through their high school. CEP again for all, all uh, schools, that's good. And uh, we talked about some portable moves there. So that's it, uh, you know, for general fund, we'll get to the, uh, public hearing, you know, it'd probably be not, not hopefully too many slides. And uh, it seems like we went over quite a bit of information. A couple funds we didn't talk about yet, the ASB fund, and uh, you can see their budget and projected here. So they have a, a <coughs> lot of, a lot of big plans for next year. You can see the revenue is up significantly as they uh, want to fundraise and, you know, travel and do trips and things. I'm not that involved in the ASB. They, they work with the fiscal officer and it's uh, students and advisories and things. And uh, big ideas, I, I grilled my fiscal officer. They want to go to Disneyland and this and that. So hopefully they can make it work. 
<laughs> but uh, they'll be they'll be in good shape here. Any questions on that? There's some revenue up here, athletics, mostly gate fees, things there, class class uh, collections for those type of things, and clubs is the big one where they collect money to <coughs> kind of fund, fund their programs. And the other uh, program, self-insured fund. So we're self-insured for workers' compensation and unemployment. You see the projected here. Um, you know, we try to watch this. We didn't quite get as much revenue. We were still down employees, so there's not as many hours that uh, gets computed on the rate. And uh, hopefully next year, th uh, those hours will go up. You know, we did have some positions we didn't fill and custodial in various areas that we're just starting to kind of get back. So, but, uh, and there is a contingency in here of 500,000 that and we don't expect to touch, but in case there's some, some major uh, L and I type things going on, we, we put that in there. But if that comes out and we get a little more revenue, we'll be okay. And we continue to monitor this and make sure we have enough money uh, based on our actuarial type of uh, requirements. And then unemployment. So we had a, a pretty big credit from the state, so we haven't had to pay much. It was during COVID, they had some, some special situations where we ended up getting a credit. So it's only projected to $50,000 of claims this year. Generally, we would think about 100,000, a little contingency here, and uh, we try to keep this fund around five fifty, six hundred thousand dollars of cash. And uh, if, if we need a little more cash, then we we try not to, um, you know, collect the money as it comes from staff and uh, premium rates if we don't have to. So uh, that's a placeholder there in case uh, we do need to collect some more funding. Any questions on uh, self-insured? Oh, and the auditors, they don't like us. Uh, every year they're saying, you know, we want you to move this cash to the general fund. And we're like, well, no, it really doesn't fit in the general fund, but we may have to move it to the general fund and then move it back out. But if it gets moved to the general fund, there'll be a liability created with it. So if we move $4 million to the general fund, there'll be a liability created as we actuarially, you know, owe that money in the future. So um, we might have to have a little conversation with auditors, but it'll mostly be one check written and then you know, maybe a check back. Any questions there? Was that what the state <laughs> auditor was referring to? They got a little prickly about that yes, when we did. were meeting. Yes, they did. They they think it'll increase the fund balance, but it won't. Yeah. It's going to go into liability. So uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, keep them happy. Yeah, so uh, June 21st, like I said, we'll plug in the numbers in the state uh, model and, you know, we're hoping we're getting pretty close uh, within 500,000 up or down. Good. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next up is K-12 student academic growth and proficiency targets. Ms. St. Hilaire will be presenting. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to be back with you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, some of our assessment data and how our kids are doing tonight. Um, this ties to our strategic goals. I just want to remind the board that we have a um, goal that our students are engaged learners, and we're just going to really tie tonight into making progress. Um, we're going to be looking at growth and also meeting grade level standards. Okay, so I just kind of want to um, remind the board that we look at lots of indicators. Um, Mid-year, we looked at MAP and Dibbles, and we also looked at On Track for Graduation. So our MAP window just closed on Friday. Uh, all of the schools have finished MAP testing. They are still doing Dibbles and Smarter Balance, so we will look at that in the fall. So for tonight, we're going to look at growth and proficiency um, that's outlined in our district performance indicators. So our growth, we want all kids growing. Our kids who are a little bit behind, our kids who are on, our kids who are above, we want everyone growing. Um, so we have goals around growth 
and then we also want to measure how we're doing and making sure we're meeting those grade level expectations. So tonight we're going to frame that all the goals tonight that we're going to talk about are around map. So I'm not going to look at everything, just what we can do with our map data. Okay. So we'll look at mostly second through eighth grade in reading and math for map. So we'll start with our elementary schools. And this is just a really broad, very high level look. Um, I do want to point out that this is all students in the grade level. When we looked at this in March, we were just looking at certain populations of students. This is the whole grade level um, that we're looking at, and we're also looking at spring to spring. So our students had to be here last spring, and then they just took it again so we can compare what happened between those two testing periods. So this slide that we have right here is related to growth that all kids are growing in both reading and in math. As a district, we have a goal. We want 90% or more of our students making their expected growth from spring to that next spring. And so you can see where we're at in third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade in both reading and math. I do want to point out, I'm going to show in a few slides how this compares to previous years as well. Um, it, it's really hard to look at this so high. It's like, well, what does it mean, <laughs> right? Um, and I also um, just, well, what do I want to say? Let's see. Um, we, this is almost hard to determine, like, what is it saying? Because we look at it also by school, we look at it by grade level at school, and we also look at it in the classrooms. Did you have a question? Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay, if just, I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. Please, so yes. So, our goal is 90 or above. Yeah. And we're 50-ish, 40-ish, 50-ish. Yep. Okay, so we're, so we're a little bit low there. Mm -hmm. um, seems like you know like um growth is related to kind of where you are right you know like if you're um if, if you know COVID, i think our numbers went really really down mm -hmm. so it feels like our growth should be like really really high right now because everybody's coming out of that so i'm kind of curious to know i'm sure we're gonna get to it like what percentage of kids are on target or above target you Okay, yeah. Yep, okay. that's going to be the next slide. Okay. So we are going to look at that. I also want to share what's hard about looking at this is we have some schools and grade levels who are a lot higher than this. Um, and I do have an appendix at the end of the slide so we can see it by grade level and by school. Um, this, this is a hard number to look at because there's a lot behind it. The other thing just to mention is when we get to the school level data at the, at the school level, and we do it too at the district level, we're disaggregating the data um, by, by program participation, free reduced lunch, uh, language learners, all of those things as well. So we can really dig in to see, look at specific student populations across the district and within schools too. So um, to your point, the next slide is looking at who is on grade level, who is making it um, and meeting those benchmarks at, at, that the grade level sets. So a little bit different um, and the indicators are slightly different as well. It's not 90%. We want 65% or more to be in the 60th percentile or above in and, reading. Uh, Alyssa, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, just yeah, I apologize please. for interrupting, but just one little nuance in this as we're talking about it. Remember our goals, our goals are for all students, right? To be engaged learners, all students to be uh, making proficiency and being at grade level. Our targets really start with where are we now? When we set these targets and the board participated in that process, it was looking at where are we now? Obviously, <clears throat> we want to be 100% all students. That's the goal, but, but the target is like if you're starting it like you said earlier if you're coming in and i'm just making up numbers but like only 30 percent of the students you we want to set targets that are get us to eventually yeah achievable targets so there's just the difference between the, the bigger goal and then the targets that we've set based on where we are i was gonna i was gonna say that you read my mind <laughs> 
Okay. Great. Um, so this, I just want to um, share, it looks like I forgot. This is for reading and math, and the percentiles are slightly different for reading and math. Um, for reading, we want them to be 60th percentile or above, and for math, it's who are the 70th, 70th percentile or above. That's what we're saying is on target. So I'm going to, any questions? Alyssa, am I remembering that I think when I just started on the board, we were at 50%. We yes. had attained that and then we moved up as a stack. Yes. Okay. Yep. I was trying to remember if that was what we had done. We, 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 we made the standard higher. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and because that ultimately, and we don't have the state assessment data back because we're still testing, but ultimately, that's kind of the, the big benchmark that we're looking at. And those percentiles are supposed to cord, uh, correlate more with students actually being at grade level on the state assessment. So that's why we raised those. Well, and, and here's a little bit of an example moving into middle school. We're just going to look at growth tonight um, because our targets are for growth are in map but in proficiency, it's in smarter balance when we look at that. So we're just gonna look at middle school growth tonight. So moving on to middle school, um, we've got sixth, seventh and eighth grade, and we're looking at growth. So these are the percentage of kids who met their growth. And I, I will point out, and I, I can share a little more data in a handout if you'd like, or follow up with a report. The amount of growth varies from grade level to grade level. So as the kids get older, they don't, the points don't change as much on the score. Um, and we use all these nice charts to um, decipher like how much should a kid be growing to make a year's worth of growth. And it can even vary depending on when the, where the student's starting the year and their score. So it, there's some complicated math going on to get these uh, averages out. All right, I wanted to show a little bit as well some of our trends over time. So we, I, we did take the last three years to look at growth and proficiency. Um, so this one is related to reading growth and you can look at um, each grade level each year. If you'd like also, you can kind of see the cohort of students. So this would be in third grade, in fourth grade, and then now they're fifth graders. Not exactly the same kids, because kids move around and we get new kids, but you can kind of see if you wanted to look at them that way as well. So this is kind of a, a helpful tool to say like, are we gaining? Are we, do we need to look at something over time? And we always wanna be trending up and seeing those percentages grow. So this one's specifically for reading growth. This one would be math growth for third through eighth grade. So students are growing in math from year to year. The next two would be meeting proficiency. So in second, third, and fourth grade, we're measuring proficiency with MAP, not smarter balance. Um, so looking at the MAP assessments that are coming back, this is the percentage of students who are meeting proficiency in those grade levels. Um, it's pretty steady in second grade. Third grade went up last year and down a smidge. And then fourth grade went up and is a little bit back down as well. And then same with math. We can see an increase in second and third grade or it's staying the same in third grade and it's down a little bit in fourth grade. So when when these assessments come in, uh, it's always a chance to reflect. Um, in education, we never quite feel like we're at the finish line. It's a lot more continuous feeling. And uh, we do have some goals and annual objectives because we want to always make sure we're getting better and our students are growing and improving. Uh, so I just wanted to point out a few things here. We continue to work on our multi-tiered systems of support. So we're making sure we're meeting all students and their needs and trying to refine how we support students. 
Um, we also are offering professional development for engaging and in rigorous instruction. Instruction has to be rigorous if we have kids growing and it can be rigorous at all levels. We want to make sure kids are being challenged appropriately all of the time. We're also making sure that we're analyzing our student data, that we're setting goals to improve, and that we're uh, identifying strategies <coughs> to improve student learning, which is what we're doing with this data right now, um, with our building principles, with our grade level teams, and starting to really um, get a focus on what we need to focus on next year. Um, I also want to highlight we have some celebrations in this data. When we look at it by grade levels and schools, there are some successes that we can see and we want to celebrate those and we want to let people know you are doing the right intentional work and we, what are you doing? How do we expand this and make sure that other students have that opportunity to grow and have success too? And then finally, I want to mention that we are going to enter into a pilot study next year around assessment. And I just wanted to share a few slides about that. Um, so there, for several years, Kennewick has been using Dibbles and MAP as some of our common district assessments in elementary school for Dibbles, MAP for elementary, middle, and even in high school. Um, in the past two years, some schools have been using STAR to be assessing and progress monitoring map and reading for academic progress and to help adjust instruction and really inform the teaching that's going on. Um, so, some districts already in the Tri-Cities area have transitioned from map to star um, for their common <coughs> district assessments. And this, this spring in March when we talked, we shared that some schools were using star um, to progress monitor students every six weeks or so and adjust their instruction based on what they were seeing. Um, so schools and teachers are using store who are using it um, really like the reports. They like that it's user friendly. Uh, it seems to be quicker assessments. It doesn't have be as not as many one on one testing situations. A lot more of it's computerized so you can test a bigger group all at once as well. Um, but we it, to do star and map is a little bit redundant and we just don't have time for that. So for next year, we're going to uh, conduct a pilot um, with schools um, to really gather some data um, and really consider strongly replacing Dibbles and map with star. And we're just we're taking volunteers right now. So schools can choose to opt into this pilot study. Uh, we want to study and compare student growth and proficiency using STAR versus MAP and Dibbles. Um, and we are, have the reporting mechanisms to look at growth with STAR just like we do with MAP. We also want to study and compare how does that translate to the state assessments uh, and those the learning students are doing. Uh, we want to look at time spent on assessments. We would like to gain time back into instruction versus um, assessments. Uh, we also want to compare and see what is the data easy to use um, and really able to address needs of students quickly. And then we also want to look at a return on investment with time, money, um, and just the cost of administering these assessments. So we, we are gathering volunteers. I think we've got about 12 schools interested. So we should have a pretty good study to look at next year um, and able to see if that would be a good move for our district to make. Any questions? Questions or comments? Uh, <clears throat> just uh, real quick, Dr. Pierce, when do we look at these goals again? When do they come to us to, because the goals come to us to kind of approve or look at, right? So, is that um, in the fall? Goals, well, uh, so there's the goals and the targets. And really at the board retreat in June is when we get information from the board to help inform the objectives. So, can you go back to that? Um, what we, what, the, the goals, like our strategic goals, our big goals, we kind of got those set. Then every year we do a process to get from the board 
this one? The, the, the one with the objectives. Like the, to inform the work that we're doing to try to achieve oh, the goals. Sorry. And we haven't for a couple of years looked at the targets. So there's the target document as well. And uh, but that would be the perfect time to have that conversation as well as if, if there's adjustments to the key indicators or the targets, it would be a great topic for the upcoming retreat. Yeah, because I, I mean, just going through this when I see like greater than 90% target and I'm seeing numbers that are in the 50s, like it just doesn't look right. Like, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I just, I guess just yeah. ultimately I want to make, just make sure we're having a, a discussion around the targets yeah. and the goals yeah. in, in detail. Is realistic, that you're saying. Or, yeah. yeah, just, I don't, <coughs> it doesn't yeah. paint a great picture in my mind looking yeah. at it saying, well, 90% of students yeah. here and we're, we're in the 50s and and, and that's why I just I get I, I like to really distinguish between the goals and the targets right. because I think right. it's so important that we're never conveying like, we, you know, we're good with like 65% yeah. or 90%, right. you know, we want 100%, mm -hmm. right? That's our, mm -hmm. that's our goal. Our, all of our goals apply to all students. But you have to look at where are you starting and, and even, you know, discussing it with schools, what we say is these are our district targets based on where we are as a district. But we've got schools that are starting above mm -hmm. and below what the district target is. Now we would never tell a school, you know, oh, you're good. You're at, you, you know, if our district target is 60% and they're at 65, they don't just say I'm good. No, your target's higher, you, go, right. you know, because yeah. we're striving toward that goal of uh, all students. And then we've got schools who are really far below the district average target so they're they're setting their target lower if i'm making sense yeah. so it's the only reason i bring that up is i i would never i just want to make sure people understand it so they're not interpreting those targets as we've got goals that aren't for all students right how far back do we have this information I mean, how do we go back five years ten years 20 years i mean how far um, it really doesn't because it wasn't until um, I got here and we uh, revamped the strategic plan and really started looking at targets for every single grade so level in four. reading and math and okay. what this is my no, so over oh, okay, this is it this is, there's not more data passed. so there's data for some of those of those targets like we have reading data that goes way back for the third grade but the target the, the proficiency level was lower because it wasn't matching up to right. the standards to that correlation between the state standard so i mean we do have data that goes back years and years but it's not exactly it's the not, same it's, as it's the not, targets we have now right and we can we can sh look at that you know but it, it is apples and oranges because it was really i think you know more focused only on reading, um, mostly focused at third grade, and um, the proficiency level was raised with these targets. I, I just want to make sure when we dive into this, mm -hmm. then, then we we put the proper time and, and mm -hmm. get into it and mm -hmm. have that discussion. That's not for now, but just whatever that is, if it's yeah. the next board retreat or yeah. meetings down the road, whatever, I, I would just like to dive into this a little bit more. Any other questions? Thank you. Right, thank thank you. you. Okay, we have no unfinished business. So next on our agenda is the new business, which is the bounty recommendation. Mr. Phillips will be presenting. Good evening. I saved mine. I'm done doing my part here. Okay, so you can take one and pass it on, or if you already have them, you're good. Oh, oh, oh wait. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. There's, there's a 5A and a 5B. 5A, 5B. Okay. There you go. And then here's the latest round of comments. Yeah. Okay. 
you know, I'd like to say thank you to the thank community you. members who, who reached out and and sent us so many comments. That's that's great. <clears throat> there definitely has been a lot of that's community okay. input. So this presentation tonight will uh, include an update on where we are in the elementary boundary uh, change process as a result of the uh, uh, the board meeting on May 10th, uh, where um, uh, the direction was to create a couple maps that we call scenario 5A and 5B. Um, and so we did that. We did an online um, uh, uh, online presentation uh, along with a, um, a survey that uh, people could take to give input. That was, again, that was both in English and in Spanish. Just a reminder <laughs> of the goals for um, the elementary uh, boundary adjustment. Uh, we really want to see a decrease in enrollment at Amon Creek and Sagecrest. They are two of our, our very largest schools. We want to distribute enrollment more equitably among schools. Um, uh, on October 1, our smallest building was Edison at 326 students, and the largest was Amon Creek at 749 students. So there was that a really big disparity. We want to distribute enrollment a little bit better than that. We want to accommodate future growth in the west end of the district. Uh, we've talked before about um, a lot of land being moved around uh, up on Riata as it crosses over the freeway between there and um, the south side of Badger Mountain. There will be a lot of homes that go in there and those homes right now are boundary to Amon Creek. So we need to make room uh, for those students. And then we, um, we want to increase enrollment at the new and larger uh, Ridgeview Elementary, right? Right now, they're one of our smallest buildings. They're in the Fruitland building. And so it works because they're small. Uh, but when they move back, they'll be uh, a larger building and then can accommodate more students. Uh, this is the timeline that we've been showing um, each board meeting. As you can see, we uh, we came to the board uh, in December just with a kind of a plan on where we were headed with the boundary change. We've actually, the county tonight, I think this is the fifth time uh, that the board has heard information on the boundary change. Um, we have gone to the public either with face-to-face -face or um, online presentations, just kind of explaining where we are um, uh, each of those times and then giving an opportunity for them to give input. And then we've shared that input with the board. And then so tonight uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, there will be a, a final recommendation uh, for you uh, and that, that would be at the end. So the criteria that we've been using when we look at each of these scenarios, and so far we've had five, I think, I think we're now to our seventh scenario. We started with three, went to four, went to five, and now we're at 5A and 5, 5B. But each time we create a scenario, we have to think about what does the scenario do with transportation, uh, with walk zones, uh, enrollment balance, like I talked about before, uh, program placements. We don't want to create a problem for like our special education program. Um, and then neighborhoods. We want to keep our, our neighborhoods um, in mind as we make these decisions. So here, the Kinnewick School District continues to seek community feedback. And actually, this is this is a slide from uh, a couple presentations ago, but we do continue to uh, go to the community uh, to to ask for that feedback uh, for boundary changes that'll, that'll take effect not next school year but the school year after that which is the 2024-2025 school year four boundary changes were initially developed uh, we asked for community feedback on those four uh, we met with the board um, on april 26 and talked about that feedback at a study session and then uh, based upon the information and the input from the board at that study session, uh, we, um, we took some components of scenario one, scenario four, to create a scenario five. Scenario five was shared with the community in an online uh, forum, again, with a chance to offer online feedback. And then we talked about that feedback at the May 10th board meeting. And then 
based upon your direction at the, at the last board meeting, we created uh, a scenario 5A and scenario 5B pretty closely. It's pretty close to uh, to the original just scenario five, but with a couple different tweaks in each scenario. So we have been seeking community input um, on those two scenarios and we're hoping uh, for discussion on the feedback, which I'll show here in a little bit. Um, where we're hoping that a decision can be made on um, on the boundary change. And I just wanted to add this again, just to make sure this is always out there. Our recommendation is that when the boundary change takes effect, 2024, 2025, is that uh, fifth grade students would be grandfathered to stay in their present school, the fifth graders and their siblings. Um, provided that the families pr provide uh, transportation for that. OK, so we'll take a look at the two scenarios. And of course, we always start with uh, the current map. It's it's kind of where we are today. Uh, you'll notice that we have 17 elementaries, but not all 17 elementaries are listed here because they're not all part of uh, any changes. So this is scenario 5A. So I'll go, I'll go through all of the, 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 the different changes um, uh, as, we, as we talk about 5A. I won't need to do that for 5B because all the changes are pretty close as they are uh, in 5B as they are in 5A. So I want to make sure the cursor works here. Yep. All right, so this area up here uh, is, a, is a, it's about 20 students and it's an area just to the west of here is uh, is Avon Creek. It sits over here. Sunset View is here. Uh, this is that that uh, that area that's just to the east of that Black Rock Coffee Stand there um, on Steptoe. There's about 20 students. Uh, they used to belong to Sunset View. We're uh, we're looking to move them uh, back uh, to Sunset View. Uh, this area here. This is all Handsome Park. We're recommending that all of Hanson Park, and it was really clear in the in the in the community feedback, that all of Hanson Park wanted to stay together. So, this is everything between Clearwater here, and then the back side of what I think is called um, the Ridge at Hanson Park. I think that's what it's called. So it's all it's all of Hanson Park, and they're going to move um, into Ridgeview. This is also this here is a little uh, a little corner of Bridgeview. There are, I believe, 46 students in that area, and we would be looking to move them into Sunset View. Sunset View is one of our small schools that we're looking to raise their enrollment. This area over here, this this is Hawthorne's boundary. This is also one of our smaller schools, and so we want to raise that enrollment. There are 76 students who live live uh, in this area here. Uh, Voland is right here. You can just barely see that street right here. This is Voland. And so off of Voland, there are about four streets that go from Voland um, to this line here. There's, there's about four streets, and then there's a street that um, runs north south. So. Those, those houses that, that uh, are on the east side of that line, they'd stay at Hawthorne, but over their back fence to where the boundary is right now for Vista, all of those students, those 76 students would go uh, to Vista to raise their enrollment. Okay, um, Edison is our smallest school, and so we really wanna try to raise that enrollment. Uh, we're looking at these two neighborhoods right here. This has been, it's, um, all of these so far have been uh, on all the scenarios. Uh, we'd be looking at moving these two neighborhoods into Edison. It's a total of about uh, 83 students. At least it was when we first started this process. Uh, moving around this way. Um, so this is the Southgate boundary. We are looking at moving this area here at the north side of Southgate, moving them into Lincoln. It's about 41 students. And then uh, we've, uh, I think probably the second time that I presented to the board, it was brought up that there is a new um, 
apartment complex going in right about in here. This is 395 along here. This is 10th. Ely sits in here. Uh, PUD building is here. It's going to be an apartment complex here. And so to help with the South Gate uh, enrollment, because they're getting pretty pretty close to uh, being at capacity, uh, we'd be looking at um, moving uh, that apartment complex to Lincoln. In scenario 5A, and actually it was in uh, 5 as well, um, this this area here is, is south of Southgate and south of Candyview. It belongs to Sagecrest. So in scenario 5A and actually in 5B, we'd be moving these two rectangles uh, up into Canyonview uh, and Southgate. This line right here is Vancouver. Uh, Horse Seven Hills uh, sits right here. And so we'd be moving these students. That is, um, let's see here, I've got it written. Um, 34 students in the smaller rectangle. And in this rectangle, it's 58 students up into Southgate. This area over here, uh, this is the south side of Thompson Hill. It belongs to Sagecrest. And in all of the scenarios that we've talked about over the months, uh, we would be moving them uh, into Ridgeview. Uh, we believe someday, hopefully, uh, crossing fingers, that there will be a road at some point that would come around this side of Thompson Hill and could quickly and easily get to Ridgeview, but that's not there. Uh, when I talk to transportation, they believe that they could, it'll be about a, uh, a five, five minute extra bus ride to get these students here around this way and up into here and up to Ridgeview. It's about a, I asked them about how much longer would that bus ride be? They said about five more minutes. The other piece here, and it's it's one of the different pieces in uh, for 5A. This is, um, this is the Creekstone area. The Creekstone, is in the Ridgeview boundary. There are about 65 students uh, in that boundary that, that go to Ridgeview. There are about 27 students, I believe, that are in this Creekstone area that already go to Lincoln. But in scenario 5A, we would be moving Creekstone uh, into Lincoln. That's scenario 5A. Do you have any questions? Okay. Comments, but I'll let you finish. Okay. So if we were to do all those moves, uh, the projected scenario enrollment would be over here on the right-hand column. So Edison, again, it was our it, it's our smallest 326. It would put them over 400. And you can just see that that difference between 326 and 749 has that's now shrunk. Um, that we're 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 not all not all schools are going to be 450. Uh, for one thing, some schools are built for about that size. Some schools like Amy Creek aren't built uh, to be that small. They have more classrooms. Um, so that that's what the projected enrollment would be for those. I believe it's eight schools actually 10 schools. Okay. Any questions on scenario 5A and the projected enrollment? Yes. Not about the scenario, but I had asked um, about the additional classrooms, the empty classrooms. Is that what's reflected in the capacity? Yes. Or? Yes. Uh, okay. So the capacity, it says, including the use of all available classrooms. So thank you. So that you're welcome. So that number is actually <clears throat> it's a it's a sum of two numbers, one being empty classrooms. And so we looked at the empty, empty classrooms as being able to take 20 students, which is a really conservative number, uh, but we use 20. And then the other uh, part of that is um, how many how many desks really how many desks are empty in all the classrooms that are being used right now? Okay. So that's five A. This is five B, and um, almost everything is identical to five A. 
the big piece is that in 5B, Creekstone does not go to Lincoln. In 5A, Creekstone goes to Lincoln. In 5B, they stay put. And this area, which was on um, the, uh, let's see, it was on scenarios one, two, and three, I believe. Um, that area is, is gonna go up into Lincoln in 5B. So this is Hildebrandt here. This is a new street, McKinley, Creekstone Boulevard and the canals back in here. And then this is Southridge uh, Boulevard. So that's 5B. And I think you have that map in front of you along with uh, the projected enrollment scenario uh, or projected scenario enrollment. Numbers are st again, it's, it's, we tried to shrink that difference between uh, biggest and smallest. Any questions on 5B? Can I go back to 5A? Sorry, I'm just trying to read all the numbers. So on 5A, Southgate is over capacity. So Southgate is, is uh, yeah, with those numbers, Southridge is over, Southgate. Over, capacity. They're over capacity. The capacity numbers, so we, you'll see in a little, in a couple more slides, a few more slides, uh, some of the community input some community members did say, you know, in both scenarios, in both 5A and 5B, Southgate, uh, their, their capacity says 439, uh, but the projected enrollment is, is, is 456. So yeah, it's, it's over capacity by what is that, 717. Um, so, uh, so today, um, Vic Roberts and I sat down, we, we pulled uh, the actual enrollment count for um, for Southgate and took a look at um, how many students were in each grade level and figure out, okay, so they have four classrooms in K3 and three classrooms in four or five. And we, we, we took another look at the capacity and I didn't change it on here because that would have, I mean, it would have looked a little hokey because now it's different. Uh, but we really believe that the capacity for Southgate is 470. If we if we look at those classrooms that are designated for a kindergarten, first, second, and third, and each classroom is, a, we, we again, it's very conservative, but we put 20 in those rooms. And then we looked at the fourth and fifth grade classrooms and said, okay, so they could go up to 25, which is also a very conservative number. Most of our schools like fourth and fifth are like at 26, 27, 28, in some cases up to 29. So we really believe after looking at it again today that that capacity number is 470. Not to make your job harder, but, <laughs> sorry. but this maybe will. So if you did that very fine tuning on that school, would you see differences in other schools if you did that? Uh, potentially, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what happened with Southgate when we originally took a look at those numbers. Like, I guess that would be possible. I just, you know, numbers are numbers, bodies are different, right? When you put all those kids in a room, it's it, it's different. Mm -hmm. And so, I just want to make sure that we're super accurate in in what we have. There. Yeah, and so as you, um, as you look at the at the other buildings' capacity and their enrollment, a lot so so we yeah we were we were off by a few with Southgate, and we really again we really believe that that the capacity is a little bit more than uh, four thirty nine. But when you look at the other buildings, you know the difference between like say at Lincoln, you know, their capacity says five forty two, and they're a long ways away from that in the scenarios. So even if even if we were to go back and take that same look with all the other schools, I, I don't think it would be enough to to, uh, to be a problem there. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So we, um, like I said, we uh, we did a an online YouTube presentation that. Um, 
that the community could take a look at to look at scenarios uh, 5 a and 5b we put that out to all the affected schools through parent square i looked uh, the, uh right before this meeting there were 743 views of um, of that presentation and there were 100 <coughs> it's 107 people who filled out the online uh, input form so we'll take a look at some of that information So this shows uh, all of those people who who uh, responded um, to that uh, online survey. You can see that Ridgeview uh, had uh, almost 60% uh, of the people who responded were from Ridgeview, uh, 62 total out of the 106. Uh, after that, it was Sagecrest, which makes sense because Ridgeview and Sagecrest really in in between 5A and 5B, those those are the two schools that are the most. I mean, they're really affected in a different way in this scenario as compared to like say five or four. And then there's a smattering of other schools. And that, that ridge view is Canyon Lakes and, and uh, Hanson Park. Canyon Lakes is Sage No, not Canyon, Canyon Lakes. Uh, Creekstone? Creekstone. Creekstone and right. Park. So uh, after the question of, you know, what school does your child attend? The, the question is, which scenario do you like best? And so scenario scenario 5A, there were 35 people who said, well, I like 5A better, 33%. Uh, and then scenario 5B, 72 people or 68% that said they liked 5B better. 5B, that's the one where Creekstone stays where they are and that area just a, the Sagecrest area, just above Hildebrand to the north, goes up into Lincoln. So I took a look at um, all the comments that you uh, have in front of you. The, the, again, I think it was, it was 100, 607, somewhere in there. And I just kind of boiled mm -hmm. that down um, to uh, just to kind of encapsulate, you know, like give you a summary of what, what that would look like or what it really looked like. So. Uh, a lot of comments that were just simply, I like 5A better because I get to stay where where I am. We, we don't have to move. But there were a few comments, uh, of course, Sagecrest neighborhood north of Hildebrand, uh, they get to stay at Sagecrest. Um, students, a few people said students are more evenly distributed. It allows for more room to grow at Ridgeview. Panoramic height students would have to cross Walk across Creekstone, which I there 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 were there was only like a couple people that said that, but I thought that was a really I think it was an important piece. It was like a bunch of people said that, but that's something we'll have to have to think about. Um, but they would have to cross, and so I'll just need to talk to April Heiser to to make sure. So would they be able to catch a bus, or would they have to walk? And if they have to walk and cross um, Creekstone Boulevard, what what, what might that look? Uh, the Sagecrest neighborhood north of Hildebrandt was moved from Lincoln to Sagecrest seven years ago. There were a few comments about that, that that, that same neighborhood neighborhood that we're talking about, they used to belong to Lincoln. Um, and, and so that I just thought that was a really uh, important comment. And then uh, uh, a couple of people said that it makes Creekstone a walk zone uh, if homes are moved to Lincoln. So if Creekstone became a Lincoln boundary neighborhood that could that would be a walk zone if for most if not all of them again that walk zone in an elementary is a mile and not crossing any major streets right like not crossing 10th or whatever that's so, part of the plan. so i think that if it's less than a mile this is what i think i don't know if you want to hear it i think but what i think it is is that if uh, if they're crossing like a like the, like if there's a there's something dangerous about that walk that's only 0.6 of a mile, then we can go through a process to take a look at that. These are the comments for scenario scenario 5B. Um, uh, so students in Creekstone get to stay at Ridgeview. Again, um, uh, I think when in that. In this slide here, where you look at the Ridgeview, uh, Ridgeview line, 62 of them, 
many of them were, that's where that comment came from, or from, from, the, from those folks. And students increase don't get to stay or visit. <laughs> Uh, the, le the least displacement of students. There are quite a few of this comment. Students who have attended Ridgeview at, Fruit at the Fruitland building uh, would be allowed to attend the new Ridgeview. There, there were just some comments about so my students have endured, you know, mm -hmm. uh, almost a year cool. and will endure another half year um, at, at Fruitland. Um, they want to be able to stay at Ridgeview. Yeah. Uh, uh, some comments about uh, 5B best meets KSD's objectives of, of increasing uh, Ridgeview's enrollment, decreasing safety risk. Uh, a few people wrote, um, and actually for, on both sides, 5A and 5B, uh, that people bought their home in a specific boundary, and now we're moving them to a different boundary. Um, relieves enrollment at Sagecrest, keeps students closer to their school. More aligned, more closely aligned with original three scenarios, and I, I'm going to guess that what they're talking about is that one neighborhood north of Hildebrand. That's that was the way it was at the first three scenarios. Um, more room for growth at Sagebrook. And then there was a question: Is is there any other input that you want to give? Um, a couple comments about Southgate uh, enrollment is over capacity. Uh, there were a few comments and there have been a few comments in previous uh, uh, feedback from from community is uh, feedback or the feedback was a uh, you know and my child's gonna be a fifth grade student in that school year now they're going to have to change schools in their last year so i just want to yeah i just want to be you know, really clear that our recommendation is that those students actually would get to stay at their home school as long as parents provide the transportation um, in each of the input um, sessions, there has been a couple comments about, uh, there, I, I'm going to assume that the, the people who live in that that small area that belongs to Amon Creek by Black Rock Coffee say that, that they shouldn't have to move to Sunset View. They said, uh, once that I can see Amon Creek from my backyard, uh, so forth. There were a few comments about boundaries should not cross 395. I've seen that one um, in in the other uh, in the other uh, sessions of input, and then um, teachers weren't asked for input. I mean, they weren't asked specifically as a teacher group. I mean, they, everybody was asked because of that. So that's a summary of parent community feedback. Questions. So <clears throat> I read all the same stuff you did, you know. Um, thank you for that summary. I think it's pretty good. <clears throat> it seems like there's like the people at at Ridgeview or the people in um, in uh, what's that word? Creekstone, Creekstone. Creekstone want to go to Ridgeview. We paid our dues, you know. We've been in Fruitland. That's kind of the sentiment. I don't blame them, you know. I just wonder how many of those people really understand the, the grant, being grandfathered in component because um, it seems like maybe that that wasn't like they're making a comment like my my kids get it but you know so I mean half of these comments I'm like that's not actually going to happen you know it's so odd. is so I just wonder if they understood that how that would change that whole data set right I mean because because that that seems like literally half of the comments were that were we've kind of I want my kid to go to Ridgeview because we paid her you know and so so I think long term it makes sense to keep neighborhoods together long term right I mean kids grow up together they're playing together that you know so to me scenario a <clears throat> keeps both neighborhoods to get intact to get together long term short term I understand so that grandfathered in element of having kids be able to go to Ridgeview from you know from Creekstone, I, I think that maybe alleviates it. So th that's kind of my over you know overview of it is is I understand paying your dues, you know that, that kind of sentiment. Long term keeping neighborhoods together, I think that's better for the community. Um, and you know 5B like splits a neighborhood in half, a, a, a strong neighborhood in half, and that school is in that neighborhood. 
And um, so I, I kind of think 5A is the best one. Considering the grandfathering element. We're just jumping in, boom, boom. Yeah, go ahead. Um, looks at you this time. Uh, grant, so talking about grandfathering students and we're, we're talking about fifth graders and, so their siblings. and their siblings. So if a student's in fifth, if a family has a fifth grader, a third grader and a kindergartner, the kindergarten and third grader are going to be grandfathered in to go to that elementary school the entire for, for that year, but not but not the rest of the time. So once they complete the year, they would have to go to their boundary school, correct? In this recommendation, yes. I mean, you, uh, so we're grandfathering for a year, but after that year, if you're in Creekstone and, and you're supposed to go to Lincoln, you're that's you be going to Lincoln the next year. So yeah. it don't, could we, change, one year. we could change that though, right? We could say. But we're also not providing them transportation. They, they have to do it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's. But then, but then we then we get run we run that part where okay, so now a family sells their house in Creekstone and they weren't grandfathered in, so now they're going to go to Lincoln. And everyone on the streets grandfathered into Ridgeview, and so it's just like that would take you'd have to have 70 families move out to move in to kind of make make that adjustment. So that's my that's my comment on grandfathering. And it's not this year; it's a year from now. Right. Correct. Yes. So yes. so those year. students who would be grandfathered, those yeah. fifth graders, uh, today they're third graders. Third graders. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. third grade. And then uh, just in, as far as enrollment goes, I mean, I I particularly like. Five being the fact that Ridgeview's up at 472 students with still some room to grow versus leaving the brand, a brand new school with 100 and ish opening. Um, you know, I look at the enrollments and and we got a couple schools in 500s and a couple in low 400s in 5A. 5B it seems kind of like it evens them a little bit more in the four, mid 400 range. Um, so just the numbers seem to make more sense to me um, that way. I mean, I don't disagree with the neighborhood comments. I mean, everybody wants to have their neighborhoods go together, but I mean, it, ultimately we're gonna, we're gonna have to make a decision and neither one's gonna, I mean, someone's not gonna be happy. So. Not perfect for anybody. Yeah. Thanks. So exactly what you're saying about, you know, leaving room for growth, so. <laughs> in 5b for both um sagecrest and ridgeview leave more room to grow but if we go back to the original reason for this it was for staffing right and to move moving or not the original but part of I think the it was part reason. of the, it, potentially part of the conversation right. and not so much having a bunch of teachers like say david creek really really part of the staffing was um like at like at Amy Creek, they just they had more had more right. of a need for for counselors. Let's let's right. say or the specialists. We had some originally right. uh, music <clears throat> teachers or librarians. Excuse me. We're going to have to or library secretaries. We're going to have to spend <clears throat> some extra time going right. and coming and all that. Yeah. And so it seems to me, if I'm looking at the numbers and I tried to write them down the other day, um, that B makes it more equitable number wise throughout. Um, the district through the elementary and that hopefully unless we have a huge influx you know on the hill there we don't have to look at moving staff around again or, or splitting a day for a staff member or something for like a specialist right that, that yeah, not, not regular yeah specialists. some schools right. will lose like classroom teachers correct just, just but right. you're not going to split like a third grade teacher 50 50 but no. you could have to do that to a specialist. We've had that conversation, right. yeah. And so I, I know how strongly uh, communities feel about their music teacher, their librarian, their PE teacher. That's a that's a very important thing too. And so, um, you know, we had an ugly situation right before I joined the board about um, between Kale High and Southridge about sharing a music teacher. And that mm -hmm. did not go very positively. And I don't wanna have to look at doing that again so i i think b there there's positive and negative in both but i think that b keeps that from happening maybe the, in a in a less less time if we keep growing wrong thoughts comments 
people spoke and it wasn't close. <laughs> yep. you know, we have to take that in consideration. The public, the people that were concerned or had thoughts clearly stated, I think it was 60 some percent, yeah, 30 some percent. Way. We have to take that in consideration. <clears throat> we are. When was the last boundary change? Someone said 2016. Is that accurate? Yeah, I can't remember exactly, Mr. Roberts. It was either it was either 2015 or 2016, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Right. If not, I will entertain a motion. I motion that the board approve well, approves uh, the recommendation of scenario 5B be implemented as the future elementary boundary effective 20, 24, 25 school year. Second. Any questions or comments? If not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? No. Ms. Sunbeck? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Rob, thank you. I know we made welcome. you jump through a lot of hoops on this, so we appreciate you going the welcome. extra a mile. Thank you. It was my mile, pleasure. Again. <laughs> he says with a smile. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Was it your pleasure? We'll do it again next year. Rob. No, he won't. We'll he do it go again. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, I, can I actually ask a question about that? Can, is there a way, like, we put this on more of a rotating schedule to kind of look at? Just, I totally uh, agree with that. You know, yes. so it doesn't get to the look point the where we've got the huge gap in enrollment so even if it's just a, every couple of years it's kind of looked mm -hmm. at to make sure we're tracking correctly i think the reason that it it happened and rob you can well, he's not listening but it, it, with our big schools that we added that made a big difference when we kept everybody at 400 it wasn't so much of as many yeah. people moving but when we went to 700 and that was the discussion when the sages when amen creek and um, Amistad. Amistad, thank you, I'm going next door. Um, that was a question and I remember Heather talking about that, that what's that gonna do? Yeah. And so that's. <laughs> and if we build a new elementary school, it makes sense to me to build it a little more on the east side, like maybe the <coughs> property behind the dam or something like that. That seems to be, because like those schools seem fixed, right? And, and adding a little more space and fluidity to those seems like the way to go. For that. Okay, uh, next meeting agenda is the semi-annual board retreat. We will be discussing the annual board self-assessment, board goal setting, 23-24 district priorities, and the 23-24 board meeting calendar. Yes. And just a reminder about that, um, the board received the link for the self-assessment. Yes, and so, thank you. Um, Yes. Yes. It was a couple days ago. Last Friday. Yeah. yeah. I can, I'll, I'll send it again. But right. um, if you can have that completed by the 31st, that gives Trisha West from WASDA time to pull through it and prepare for that part of the facilitation of the retreat. So well, I'll perfect. remind you. Thank you. <laughs> How long? How long? I was just going to ask how, how long it like it, it sounds like it's two portions. So how long is Trisha's portion versus the actual portion where we're? Yeah, you know, I think we, we did, I, I when I talked with her and, you know, we can modify this, but we took essentially, you know, 90 minutes for that part and then the rest of it for the priority setting. And so similar to how we structured it yeah. last year. Okay. Well, you have something? Yeah. Do we want to make provisions for uh, graduation? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I have that on my to-do list to schedule. Um, I'll send out some meeting invitations just so we can get some time on our calendars, both between <laughs> ceremonies, but prior to that, to the ceremonies too. So I, I will do that. Perfect. Okay, if nothing else, uh, we are going to uh, adjourn into a executive session here for they say 20 minutes and i'm going to say 30 because we never hit our time in my guess so we will be in the executive session until approximately 7 50.
Thank you so much.